Hello everyone. Today we start the second week of Advent. Advent is a time set aside by the church to spiritually prepare us for both the celebration of the birth of Jesus or the first coming of Jesus and for the return of the Lord or the second coming of Jesus. As part of the preparation, we read and reflect on the scriptures relating to the comings of Jesus. The first readings from the book of the Old Testament narrate the prophecies that foretell the birth of Jesus. The second readings, chosen from four different letters of the New Testament, speak about the second coming of Jesus. And the Gospels recount the setting and historical circumstances surrounding the birth of Jesus. Friends, there are two predominant views about the nature of Jesus' second coming. 1. The second coming of Jesus is often referred to the hope of believers that in the fullness of time or at the end of time, Jesus will return to earth, conquer his enemies and rule triumphantly over life in heaven and on earth. 2. The second coming is closely connected to the glorious appearance of Jesus at the time of her death when we believe that we will see him face to face. Speaking of Jesus' second coming, St. John says, When he appears, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. And every man who has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. But since we do not know the exact time of our death, we are called upon to be always prepared for it. Last Sunday, we read how St. Paul had aroused the Christians in Thessalonica to constant vigilance and preparedness. He urged them to prepare themselves for the coming of Jesus by increasing their love for one another and being blameless in holiness before God. That is to say, we Christians must keep increasing our love for one another, always walk in holiness, and be prepared for a death that finds us in a state of grace, even when we die under tragic circumstances. Friends, in today's second reading, we hear another exhortation to preparedness for the coming of the Lord. The text is a part of the letters and Paul to the Christians at Philippi, a small town in Greece at the time of Paul. The letter is one of the four prison epistles which Paul wrote during his first imprisonment in Rome for two years. Other letters are to the Ephesians, Colossians and Philemon. Imagine he was in prison facing possible execution, his own circumstances were difficult and yet he wrote to express his love and care and to encourage other believers to have hope, peace and joy. From the reading, we learn four facts about St. Paul. 1. Paul was joyful because of his intimacy with Jesus Christ and his experience of God's love through other believers. He wrote, I pray always with joy in my every prayer for all of you because of your partnership for the gospel from the first day until now. Friends, Paul loved all the churches which he had founded and he prayed for all of them and wrote to them letters of instruction, correction, guidance and encouragement. Even while in prison, Paul did not think of himself but of those communities. He remembered and prayed for them, and he did so with joy. Especially he recalled how from the beginning the Philippians partnered with him in the spreading of the gospel through their friendship and financial support. The Christians in Philippi were not rich, but they supported Paul in his work with more than the gift of money. For instance, in his letter to the Corinthians, Paul commended the generosity of the churches of Macedonia which include the community at the Philippi. So, when Paul remembered what they did for him, both when he was with them and when he was apart from them, he was extremely happy and thankful and he prayed for them. His love for them was so deep 
that he called the Philippian church his joy and crown. 2. Paul was confident in the Lord. He wrote, I am confident of this, that the one who began a good work in you will continue to complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. Friends, throughout his ministry, Paul suffered rejection, misunderstanding, suspicion, shipwreck and imprisonments. And yet, when he thought of the works of God in his life, he was full of joyful praise for and total confidence in God. Particularly, he remembered God's work among the Philippians and was very confident of its completion even though he was not with them. He did not allow the prison circumstances to discourage him. Deep down, he believed that God was in control of all things and he would accomplish all his purposes. 3. Paul was faithful in his love for the Philippians. He wrote, God is my witness, how I long for all of you with affection. Friends, Paul was an observant and well-respected Jew. He was a great intellect and highly educated, but he was also a man of tender compassion and love. He loved the Philippians with the same kind of tender care with which Jesus loved the world when he gave himself for it. So, he could even call God as his witness regarding his love for the Philippians. 4. Paul showed his love and affection toward the Philippians through his prayers. He wrote, I pray that your love may increase ever more and more in knowledge and every kind of perception to discern what is of value so that they may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ for the glory and praise of God. Friends, Paul knew that the Philippian Christians loved God and one another a great deal. Moreover, he personally experienced their love and support for him. So as a sign of appreciation and gratitude, he prayed to God on their behalf. His prayer for them was very simple, but the most important to their life. He prayed that the Philippians may still increase and abound in love. He did not pray for their love to begin, but to overflow, to increase more and more. In other words, no matter how much they loved God and one another, he wanted them to love more and more. However, Paul did not speak of some sentimental kind of love, but of love that is grounded in knowledge and discernment. Knowledge here refers to the understanding of God's word. It comes from studying and meditating on God's word and conforming our lives to God's word. By understanding God's word, we will understand how we can truly love God and others. Knowing about love is not enough. We also need discernment in applying this knowledge of love to practical everyday situations in life. That is to say, the love that God wants us to have is not just a feeling, but a conscious act of the will, a deliberate decision. So Paul prayed that the Philippian Christians may choose to love God and one another more and more based on their knowledge and discernment of God's love through God's word, so that the love may be pure and blameless until the second coming of Christ. Friends, there are four things that are needed in all of our lives as followers of Christ. 1. Just like Paul, we must have a personal relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ and always thankfully remember all the great and wonderful and awesome things God has done in our life so that we can also pass through and overcome even the most adverse circumstances and live a joyful life. 2. Our confidence in the Lord must be like that of Paul's. It is easy to feel discouraged when trapped in low moments. But as believers in Jesus Christ, we must have an unshakable confidence that God is in control of our life. We must remember that God knows our future and that He will complete the work He has started in our life. 3. We must be committed to unfailing love and faithfulness. 
Our love for God and others must not depend on any external circumstance, nor must it be determined by your position or status or circumstances. Rather, no matter how difficult the circumstances are, let us love one another without limitations and let us aim to increase our love. Let us also make God our witness and do whatever the Lord commands us to do through his word. Since God's love for us is so pure, sincere and unchanging, let us in return give him and others a love which is pure, true and genuine until the end of time or until the day of our death when we see God face to face. 4. Paul's prayer for the Philippians is a beautiful example for us on how we should be praying for one another. Let us gratefully remember all of the good things that God has done through others and joyfully pray for those people that they may gain greater knowledge and better understanding through God's word and wisdom to apply God's word to their daily lives. Amen.